and welcome to Mind the Gap with me, Tom Sherrington, and my partner in crime, Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Good evening, Tom. Are you well? Yeah, really well. I'm really excited that we have today Adam Boxer, the one, the only Adam Boxer in the room. Hello, Adam. Hello. How are you? Really good. Yeah, and it's a nice sunny evening, and uh, we're looking forward to this chat. Uh, there's so many things that we can talk to you about because you do. You seem like the busiest science teacher, head of science there is, and you're just like I, I see you all the time. And you're you're we were saying before that your science book that you've just written is pretty special because it's done really well, and it's not just read by science teachers. And you have this sort of huge sort of Twitter presence. Every time I go on Twitter, you're kind of there. Um, and also you've, you've developed a whole platform, Carousel Learning, you've talked about that, but I'm just interested in, in your kind of, what your kind of driver here, because you're, you're, you're a kind of science teacher, head of science, but you're also kind of interested in the system and debates and it's interesting, isn't it? But what, what do you feel like your kind of key kind of passion is in, in this whole endeavor of being a teacher and being a, a middle leader in a school? Don't start with the easy questions, do you? No, this is a big one. I want to go I, big. Like a bit, I, I gave up being a particularly introspective person a while ago. Um, and like when it comes to motivations and stuff, uh, I'm a bit hedonistic at the moment. I just sort of follow the things that I like and think are important without thinking too much about it. So like mouthing off on Twitter just because like I enjoy it. I like doing it. Um, and like with the teaching and things like that, I, you know, I just pursue the things that I like and I stop doing the things that I don't like. So, for example, you mentioned I'm a head of science. As of September, I'm not going to be head of science because I hate being head of science. So I'm not going to be head of science anymore because um, I've got to the point where I'm like, well, actually, I, I don't need to do things that I don't like doing. And I'll just do things that I do like doing. So I like running carousel. I like teaching and not being a head of department. I like going to schools and delivering training and stuff like that. So I'm not going to be head of department anymore. I'm going to go three days a week. I'm going to still mouth off on Twitter. You know, I'm just going to do things that, that I like. And, and hope that I manage to pay the mortgage, but actually, more importantly, my energy bills. So hopefully, we'll all be able to make ends meet. But such is life. Oh, so Adam, really it's like good. a flexible working hybrid career. This is right up my street. <laughs> oh, it's going to be it's going to be absolutely glorious. I'm going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in school. Monday and Friday, I'm going to be doing one to two days carousel a week, and then basically it'll, it'll be like one day carousel a week, and then maybe a couple of, couple of extra hours on a Monday, and then training and CPD and writing and things that will bring a bit more zen and balance into my life. That sounds really cool. I mean, are you, so are you going to be one of these sort of awkward people that the new head of science is going to have to manage? You know, Adams in the team, and but are you going to be like really good with them and, and give them kind of their own sort of the <laughs> give them the reins fully uh, well i mean it's it, it's a re you know it's it's it could sound like a flippant question but it's actually like super important and i think uh one of the things we're not good at in schools is succession planning uh, and part of that is because there's never any there's like in most industries there's handover period right you get a job and you're replacing someone and they're still there and there might be a week or two weeks where you're overlapping and there's a proper handover in schools it's like no i work for one school till the end of august and then i work for the next school on the first of september and it's like there's no there's no handover so we're very lucky we, we appointed internally so it's one of my colleagues who is becoming head of department um and we have explicitly spoken about um, how we both so succession planning to start with so already they've started taking on we've done joint learning walks we've done joint feedback sessions we've done joint policy writing stuff um, you know all sorts of things that we've you know that I've started to bring them into because it'll make their life easier next year um, but also we one of the things that um, so Chris my boss my principal who's just like an absolute legend um, you know he was talking to me about what exactly I did want to do next year because he wants me to do some teaching and learning type stuff across the school and we both agreed and were very clear that um, that I would not have any kind of responsibility within the science department um, like until the new head of department decided that that they would want me in uh, and I'm literally just another member of the science department nobody's going to be looking to me nobody's going to be asking me anything I will be we have a, like a beautiful departmental culture where if anyone does ask me something like that I will be very clear I'm not the head of department ask ask them it's not got anything to do with me anymore um and uh I mean it's yeah. nice to have that nice to have gone through that process um yeah 
Yeah. So yeah. So you're, it, it sounds like a great combination of doing the teaching bit and and doing the, and the carousel learn. So, I mean, I'll, even spinning off that one answer, I want to ask you about all of it. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Like Emma, what do you think? Where where, where do you? Want to I'm just wondering. Begin? I'm just wondering if it's going to end up being like Clark Kent in the newsroom. He just looks like a normal human, and then every so often something's going to come up, and you have to run off into a phone box and become out like super super teacher to go run the department again. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you are going to bequeath a copy of your book to your successor as a joining gift. Well, not only do they already have one, but they are named in the acknowledgements. Yay! That is, that is excellent. So normally, we, if, when we have someone who's an author on our podcast, we like, you know, on the video bit, we share the book. But literally, I have two copies of your book, and both of them are now um, have made their way to my wife's school. So wait so a second, I don't understand, I don't understand. How many floors are there in your home? <laughs> two, two stories or three there, there, there are two two stories okay. in the right, so why don't you have three copies of the book i know i should and what, I'm what do you do what do you tom answer me this what do you do <laughs> if you're in the attic and you suddenly think to yourself i can't remember the difference between a prerequisite knowledge quiz and a prior knowledge quiz like how do you even deal with that scenario if you don't have a copy in the attic as well well i cry for a few minutes and then when i <laughs> I, 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 want, I want to start I a, com <laughs> a competition though, Adam, as like extreme reading, because I've taken your book to swimming lessons with my children. So your book has been to the swimming pool. It might not have been in Tom's attic, but it's definitely been to three lots of swimming lessons. I, I'm not sure it's ready to learn how to swim. It's made a paper. <laughs> it's not got the prerequisite or the prime. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Okay, so I, I, want, I want, because we've said a few things to people who don't, who don't know what it is, um, and we can talk about this more, but you're going to go three days a week as a science teacher, but so that the, the carousel learn is a big thing that you've set up. So, I mean, this is your platform to tell people, what is it? You know, people who don't know what it is, what is it? And why are you so passionate about it? Um, I, there's a sentence that I tried to memorize and then failed to memorize, which is ironic. I think it goes, carousel learning is an innovative online learning platform aimed at improving your students' long-term memory and retention through the power of retrieval practice something along those lines it's okay so 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 essentially yeah what what it, what it is is it's a way of doing retrieval practice right but it's the best way of doing retrieval practice because um most you know there's there's tons of online platforms that you can use to set homework and whatever um but what we try and do is is there's i guess a couple of things that we do that are a bit different the first thing that we do is that it's it's entirely teacher directed content so you're not even though you can use We've got loads of like content in the community that either we produced or other teachers have shared, um, which is very kind and you know, gracious of them, of course. Um, but the idea is that you then get to select exactly what it is that your students are learning. Uh, with most online platform, it's like you're using their content and then they're not quite, it doesn't quite match up with your curriculum. There are things that you wouldn't teach, things that you would teach, not quite in the same order. Um, and it doesn't quite work. Um, and like we know how important curriculum is and where you have that kind of incoherence, it just it's just not great. But secondly, and this is the thing that we've really been working on over the last, I guess, 18 months, which is that we are strong believers that if you want kids to know something, they need to do retrieval practice. And we're also strong believers that there's not enough time in the school day to do that. So that the heavy lifting there has to be offloaded at home, right? So you have to, this, the, the bulk of the retrieval practice that students do has to be done at home. But if you just set retrieval practice for kids to do at home, it won't get done or it will get done to a bad standard. So what we've been looking at is essentially, and, and I think the reason for that is because pe students especially don't, they think of homework as like a bolt on, right? Something that is like, that exists separately uh bolton is probably the wrong word it's like hermetically sealed it's like separate from their normal schoolwork and they do their classwork and they do their homework because they've got to do it and sir sets it and end of story but like they don't see its value they don't see the meaning they don't see the purpose and what we've been really trying to work hard at is to show is to use carousel to integrate homework with classwork uh, and to kind of feed one into the other um, and to essentially use the teacher's presence and always project that into the kids like homework life as well so that in the same way that a teacher in a room can get kids 
a teacher in the classroom can get kids to do things that those kids won't do if the teacher's not in the room. That's obvious. So it's about figuring out how you get that kind of presence and motivation and feeling to, to, to feed through into the homework as well. So one really quick example is um, the feedback screen. So if I set a quiz for my students, uh, I can mark it, they self-assess it, and then I can moderate or mark their work. And then I get a feedback screen that tells me the things that the students found harder, so they got wrong most frequently. I use that as the do now in my next lesson. And the reason why I do that is because the students, I tell the students very explicitly that if they get it wrong in class, then what that tells me is the sequence of events was they went home, they logged in to do their quiz, tap, 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 did the quiz, got a whole bunch of stuff wrong, and then just walked away. And that was it. They pressed submit, and that was the end of their homework. That was the end of their study session finished. And I said to myself, I said, guys, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Now, I don't understand how you could leave a computer, how you could leave the screen not knowing it. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, it's, 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 and obviously, like, it does make sense to me, but this is what I say, yeah. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it, if it were me, I'd be sat there and I wouldn't walk away until I knew it. Can you imagine if I was planning your lesson last night? Uh, and I, sorry, that's, that's ice cream, Ben. Outside your house. I've, I've got that going around me as well. It's the sun. Okay. The sun. Open. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I said, I said, look, can you, can you imagine if I was planning my lesson last night and I, I planned it a bit and I thought, you know, I've done a rubbish job, but yeah, that's fine. And I just turned up and I hadn't planned my lesson. I'd be in front of Mr. Fairburn within minutes. Can you, like, it's unacceptable. And I, that's the nice version. And I, I then say to him, when, when, you, when you do these questions in class, if you then get them wrong, that'll, that'll upset me a lot. I'll, I'll be really cross if that happens. I'll be disappointed if that happens. And then I follow through on that, right? So if there are kids who are doing that, you, you pick that up pretty quick. And, and basically what that means is that over time, when a kid, what that means is that the next time the kid does the homework is that they do the quiz. And if they get stuff wrong, they know that they're going to get hell from me the next lesson if they still know it wrong. So they don't leave their laptop or their phone or their computer or their tablet or whatever it is until they do know it. But that's, that's kind of, that's, that's me bringing myself into their, like, homework yeah, world. Stuff like when you say can and can't do it, this is stuff they can know because it's just, um, like, knowable stuff, which is you've explained it already and they have to just rehearse it. Yeah. So there's no risk of them just not being able to find out the answers and, and sit there struggling. Exactly. And, and the answers are provided to them. It's because the, because the way it works is they have flashcards and then they do a quiz. So everything is provided to them. It's not, I'm not just, you know, saying to them, yeah, you've got it wrong. Now you must magically get it right. They go back to the flashcards. They then practice those and then they move back to the quiz. Uh, that, that's the idea, at least. So is the carousel primary one a homework model or is it a in-class type model? Again, it's it's both, you know, so... We, this is, I think you're referring to, we just launched about mm. a month ago now our Carousel Primary offering, which came with multiple choice functionality and with, I think we got over 20 question banks. So we've got the whole of National Curriculum for Science, we've got geography like biomes, climate change, volcanoes, earthquakes, and then we've got things like the Iron Age, Romans, um, Maya, the Shang Dynasty, Ancient Egypt, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then maths as well, tons of maths. Um, but, but yeah, basically what, what we found is that our primary practitioners, so the, the, you know, the teachers, our pr the primary teachers who are using us the most, again, are, are, are doing, doing both. They're setting stuff for the kids to do at home, but they're also using the whiteboard quiz functionality, which is how you use Carousel to give you like a do now starter. They're using the feedback. They're getting the kids to get the tablets out. Mo uh, not, I don't know about most, but lots of primary classrooms have one-to-one -one devices. If you, you know, you can choose to book them out or whatever, and you can just tell the kids, get the iPads out and they can do a quiz there and then can turn the short, sharp stuff. Some of them are using it for like um, summative assessment-y type stuff. So at the moment, a lot of primaries don't have an assessment regime for foundation topics. Mm -hmm. So, you know, someone goes in and says, so, you know, you taught them Roman Britain, how much of Roman Britain do they know? And you're like, <laughs> but like, but like, it's, it's fair enough. Cause like, you, you know, these poor kids, like they're eight years old. They, you know, they, it's enough that they already have to do all of these tests and things like that. You don't want to have to get them to sit down and do a pen and paper, like exam. No one wants to have to write that, let alone administer it. So what you do is, 
Yeah, is it, sorry, is, is this free? I mean, I know you started off being free, but is this, is this are you sort of developing like a kind of commercial model or is it, is it important? That it's yeah, it's, yeah, so, so there, there is a free package called Silver, but it's, it's limited in function. Um, basically, I'm never allowed to talk about money because I just want to give it away to everyone for free. Um, but no, they're the, you know, there's different subscription plans and models and you can have an individual account, a department account, a whole school account, a MET account, that kind of stuff. Um, cool. in, in when, when we first started it, Josh, my co-founder, um, it grew out of Retrieval Roulette, which is this Excel program that I made for helping with retrieval practice. It's completely free and available to everyone. Uh, and Josh was like, you know, look, we can turn this into something that will help people. Um, and I said, like, I just think it, you know it's gonna sound am i allowed to swear on this what's the deal with language yeah, yeah. Agree, yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean okay like, like i don't want to sound dick about anything but i was like i'm not i didn't make retrieval roulette to to fleece people uh and we were really careful when we launched that you know we tried to make things so that try to anticipate and avoid teachers paying out of their own pockets we tried to make sure that the 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 fee structure was low um and you know we're not we're not extorting people we're trying really hard to be reasonable and whenever we bring out a new feature we always like wrangle over which package it's going to be a part of because like unfortunately we you know we do have to pay stuff right developers need to get paid course, yeah. um and you know otherwise yeah it's just what makes the world go around but we want to be reasonable as well yeah for sure well, I'm, gl I'm glad you're charging for it because then other otherwise you'd be making me look really bad because I charge for it. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my god, I could. I don't think I could bear the guilt, you know. So I'm sort of feeling, you know, and it, it's it's not a it's not a crime to 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 run a business which makes. No, no I, I agree. I agree, and and fundamentally, like we've, you know, Josh Josh works in ed tech. That's his job. Um, but he's chosen to work in ed tech. He could have worked. He could have worked in any other tech and probably made more money. Um, but he's chosen to work in education because he cares about education. Um, what that means is that by definition, you'll be more caring about the people that you're selling to. It's also like public purse, right? The, the money that is coming into us comes is taxpayer money. Um, it's not, you know, giant corporations that are giving us Wonga. So like you have to treat that with a certain um, like that, that money to me in my head, it's sacred. Uh, it's it, yeah, it can't be fr it can't be frittered. And we have an obligation um, to do good. the right thing with it. Yeah, I, I think I think that sounds that sounds sensible. I mean, do you think? I mean, Emma and I had a conversation about homework and primary homework and stuff recently, and, and lots of conversation about curriculum. <clears throat> so, do you think? Can you see this sort of making a, an impact, Emma? Well, in primary, yeah, it's it's a funny one because primaries are so each individual primary is so different in terms of their homework strategy or their homework approach. You will get some schools that are absolutely anti-homework at primary. Like it just doesn't happen. The only thing they want to do is read, 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 read. And that will be the culture of that particular school. You get some other schools where, you know, children get tons and tons of homework. And then you get other primary schools where they only really get homework sort of upper key stage two. It's very much individual kind of school culture dependent. As a parent, my personal preference is just let them there's so much they're doing outside of school already, swimming, gymnastics, playing outside. It's, it's, apart from reading, it's, it can wait. As far as personally, I think, I think there's, I think there's too many pulls on childhood to kind of fill their days with tons of homework. But I do recognise that there are certain parts of the curriculum that if you don't loop outside the classroom and keep bringing it back round again, are just going to be lost and the primary curriculum is so stuffed and there's so much stuff in it and Adam reeled off all that list of things just off the top of his head that we have to do uh, and you aren't going to remember it all unless you reach further than the classroom in some instances so I think used really sensitively it's got you know massive potential but and especially I like, I like the fact you've built these sort of motivational loops in because and that kind of redoing and that aging mm. students becoming students so and there's so many retrieval practices i see where, where, where the teachers almost like it's like the process is quiz them give the answers bosh but there's no the students almost like well what's it got to do with me but i mean are you finding your students adam and then have, have they really progressed through this i mean do you see it, its impact yeah i think so um you know ask me again in six weeks time when we get our results but but, but yeah look it's it's very difficult for i'm not good at pulling myself out um when you're looking at a change at, at, uh, 
change is slow, right? And the time scales here are long. Um, and you don't expect things to be better by the next day already when it comes to learning and memory. Now, what that means is that if you manage to clone Adam from a year ago and brought Adam to my classroom now, I'm sure that Adam would see a big difference from what it was like a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. But like, I'm, I'm in the moment, I'm with them. And, and that process is so gradual that it's often, um, you don't notice it happening. Uh, and you're always driving for more and you don't see it happening. You're, you're only ever seeing like the end goal rather than uh, the steps that you've made. Uh, it's a bit like just getting old. Nobody notices themselves older tomorrow than they were yesterday. Yeah, you might look back after 10 years and say, God, I remember when I was, you know, 21 years old, I could, you know, I could, I could drink till the early mornings and I'd be fine the next day. And now I'm like, oh, I had a little eggnog with dinner and I'm under the table. It's like, <laughs> it's, like it's, it's, it's the classic frog in a, in a water situation, isn't it? And you, you yeah. in a positive sense, in this case, because yeah. you're seeing incremental change and you have to have trust. So I, I want to ask you about a couple other things here, because one of the things I feel like you're, I, I think people know about you because you're, you've got strong views and you express them and you, you're kind of robust in that. Um, now, and I'm not going to sort of spend the, the rest of this interview kind of asking you to um, <laughs> explain your back catalogue of, of Twitter provocations. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting a bit goody, Tom. You're going to stop. Been, there's been quite a few <laughs> like, like, I mean, for example, recently, I mean, you, you, you get passionate about behaviour management and when it's terrible and when it's good. And so this whole issue about behaviour is communication. And, you, and yours, <laughs> I think the recent thing that caught my attention was something like, staple this to someone's head next time they say, nobody believes this is true about yeah. behaviour being a communication. So, I mean, it's interesting. So these debates are sort of prog trad kind of stuff. And we've discussed this before with James Mannion. Why do you feel so strongly about these things? Is it because you see it has been terrible before or, or do you see other people struggling with these issues? Um, when you, I, I, I'm an, I'm an all or nothing guy, right? I invest and I invest hard and, and I care a lot about the things that I do. And like, so for example, line management is a great example. Yeah, I care a lot about the people that I line manage and, and I'll fight for them and I'll do everything that I can for them to protect them, to make their lives easier, to make them better teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're line managing someone and they're literally crying to you because of the way that a 13 year old has treated them, you can't help but feel passionately angry at people who would belittle that experience. And when someone turns around and says, you know, if a kid tells you to fuck off, right, tells you you're a shit teacher, tells you you shouldn't come in tomorrow, that kind of stuff. And then someone else says, don't take it personally. I mean, like, who the hell do they think they are? Like, what kind of, how righteous do you have to think you are to be able to utter such an unsympathetic, uh, an unempathetic um, statement and, and it really upsets me and then people like this end up getting into the corridors of power uh, and their and these like their ridiculous ideas filter down and they're never the ones who suffer because of them they're never the, you know they're, they're never the ones who are on the receiving end of it you know these you know these uh, these people who are pulling kids out of lessons giving them a hot chocolate and taking them back these people who are getting a getting getting a, an email request to come and remove a child and deciding there and then if they think it's worth it if they think what the kid's done is bad enough for them to be removed people who are saying that you know kids who are routinely destroying lessons kids who are routinely being verbally and occasionally physically abusive to their peers and to their teachers that they should um, be better understood and shouldn't face a consequence and should certainly not be removed from the situation I mean, these people are, these people are deluded. You know, one of the, one of the people online who was talking about this recently, um, I mean, I, I, I asked her a while back because um, I literally was, it was, she, she was, she was talking about again, unmet needs, communication, blah, 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 nonsense. And um, literally that day, someone that I was line managing 
had been and who is a an NQT, it's not my current, not my current school, an NQT, a previous school. I'd walk past a lesson and they were running a practical and there was a child who literally was shouting in her face. He was he was trying to ask her a question about the practical or whatever. He was shouting in her face, answer my question like this. And she was like, you know, she's like 21 years old. He's a you know relatively big lad, he was 14 or whatever, but he's still bigger than her. And she's like shutting down and, and like, like running away from him in the lab. And he's just following her around going, talk to me, talk to me now, answer my question. And like, obviously I intervened and, and helped deal with the situation and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then I, I just posed this issue to this person who was going on about it. And like, she was like, well, he clearly needs to have a conversation. Maybe he needs to storyboard it out. And I'm just like, like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> like, do you... <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I can see that, like the storyboard. So it's interesting because clearly that student, the, the students who do these things, I mean, I, I've been in situations, I know exactly what you're talking about. I've, I, I, I've, I've sort of been burned alive by teenagers myself as a younger teacher yeah. and, as an, and as an older teacher. Yeah, and it's not fun. It's and not it keeps fun. you up at night and it wrecks you with shame and, and it, guilt it, and a sense it, of despair. So, so that, that, that's all true, isn't it? So what, what, what's interesting though is that so people, you, you sort of, those, other, those children who are doing those things do need support in a sense. To, 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 of course they do. And so it's all about not whether they need help, it's about the fact that the teacher has, you know, it's, it's, it's getting a sort of the rounded picture of that, isn't it? it? It gets so black and white, doesn't it? Like that student clearly needs to be removed. And so in the schools you've worked with, where, where you've got like procedures to deal with that, which are much more robust, do you find those students are able to sort of self-regulate much better because they know the boundaries are much more explicit. They, they can do. Um, you know, like I teach, I teach at a school, you know, wonderful place where we do not have a binary behavior policy. We do not use, you know, 24 hour exclusion for a kid, you know, speaking out of turn or whatever. We don't do that. You know, we have a much lighter, softer system that relies a lot more on, um, uh a, a gentle approach but like if a kid is racist to a teacher they're not coming back into school the next day yeah they're, they're toast for a couple of days right if a if a student is takes it too far with the teacher and is swearing at them and is being violent and aggressive they're never seeing that teacher again they are being moved they're not going to be in the same classroom as that teacher ever again, because like you have to protect your people. Right now, we know that like we have an inner city cohort. We know that our students come from extremely difficult backgrounds um, and like life is not easy for them. Yeah, we're not monsters. We understand that. But there are also consequences to actions. And, you know, that, that that's the way the world works. You know, and those consequences are always proportionate uh, and are always measured and are always aimed at preventing that behavior from happening again. But like to say that we, you know, say, oh, well, consequences are a bit, you know, passe. They're a bit, you know, 20th century behaviorism. It's like pigeons in boxes or whatever. No, well, so, you know, asking the kids to like design their own rules or telling the teacher they need to mediate and apologize to the child for what they did that triggered them. Like... Just... So, uh, so Emma, what's your, I mean, uh, I think Aaron and I have had similar experiences of our own about around this. So what's because you? It's, uh, it's how, very different. This whole discourse. It's just so different at primary because you have the same children all day, and so your relationships with them are are completely different. And in some ways, it's more challenging because if you've got a child who's constantly on the cusp of doing of unacceptable behaviour, it is exhausting because you never get a break from that behaviour. Yeah, you've got to keep, keep a lid on it, keep a lid on it, keep a lid on it, keep a lid on it. All day, and you don't get that changing. You think you don't, I think Tom mentioned it before, you know, you don't think, right, it's 11 o'clock, I've only got to get to 11 o'clock and I've got a different set of yeah. children. You are kind of like an uber parent as a mm. primary school teacher. You're a primary, you're a, you've got a class of 30 and you, you, you don't treat them like your own children, but there is the opportunity to have a different sort of relationship than you would yeah. have in the and you have to because you can't maintain that same level for six and a half hours a day. You have to have an ebb and a flow to it. But I've taught in classes where there are children who have 
almost broken me just with exhaustion from that. Um, and I think it's a myth as well that at primary don't get really challenging, defiant behaviour that, that's really, really testing because we kind of get the opposite that very often the children haven't um, had a diagnosis for anything or haven't been through, haven't been picked up by the system that, and they, that they re- need really specialist provision. And so we've got re- children with really high needs in a mainstream class and nowhere for them to go. Yeah. We don't have centralised attention and we don't have... You don't have an SLT to come out. I was the head and I'm still teaching. Who do I send them to? Yeah, it's yeah. a different challenge in primary, but I agree that you have you have to protect your staff, your, their well-being and their kind of mental health because it can be absolutely professionally and personally devastating if you're so exhausted and kind of driven to the edge by um by challenging behaviour. But it's how, how, how you get so passionate about it because I feel like it does, like, like the fact you're talking about your, the people that you know and you've line managed, there is that duty of care. This is why people find teaching hard. This is why they leave. It, it, it winds people up. Sometimes, mm-hmm. though, I feel like even the way you describe that there, because one of the things I, I really respect and, and admire about you is how kind of positive you are about the school you work in. Like you really take the pains to sort of big it up and celebrate it. You know, I, mean, I saw you did a whole Twitter thread about why it's so With great. good reason. Yeah, and I could see that. It's really great. I love I love it when people do that. It's not just here's our results, whatever. It's like look, this is all the cool things we do, and this is why it's great to work here. But it's so interesting to hear you saying like it 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 has this sort of you know it doesn't have some giant regime. It just has some sort of firm boundaries. And so, but teachers clearly feel supported within that. Do you, do you think sometimes it's it's like we. Like when, it, when it came down to a sort of case by case, some of the discourse is too polarised and people, if they actually dealt with that specific situation, might agree. Or, or, or do you think Twitter just, I don't know, do you think those people really would handle that situation differently? I mean, I, I've, I don't know. Like the, the point of, the point, the, you know, the first tweet that you came back to, I said, staple it to someone's face is because people are literally saying this stuff. Yeah. Right? They're literally saying this stuff. I, yeah, people DM me with, all sorts of insane stories um, and people who are put back in a classroom the next day with kids who have hit them um, and or have been, you know, verbally abused. And this isn't the majority of stuff, right? The majority is just like that daily grind of just constantly having to battle with bad behavior. And, you know, you've asked me, I'm passionate about it. Like, I, I want to be really, really clear. Yeah. I despise talking about behavior. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I hate dealing with it. I hate talking about it. I hate absolutely everything to do with it. It is the part, the single part of my job that I resent the most. If I never had to deal with behavior again and <laughs> instead had to mark or do data entry, I'd pick the data entry every single time <laughs> without a question. It gnaws, it gnaws at my soul and it makes me feel utterly miserable. I hate it. I'm glad but, we picked it as a topic then to discuss. <laughs> but, 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 but this is the key. Yeah, this is the key. I'm happy to talk about it because I think it helps. Yeah. And when I say online that I feel like shit because of what my year nines did to me, or I stayed up all night thinking that I'm a terrible teacher because they were messing around so much. People message me and they say, thank you. Right. When I do a video that says, look, I hate dealing with behavior. So these are the things that I do to try and stop it becoming a problem. I get tens of thousands of hits because it helps people and it makes a difference. And if I can do that, then then I'm going to do that, despite the fact that I would very much rather live in a world where I didn't have to do that. There are people who love dealing with behavior stuff. Yeah, they yeah. It, it's it's their calling, it's their passion. I get it. They love dealing with these kids who are just so difficult and and make bad decisions and are just children and are 11 year olds and 12 year olds and 13 year olds and the rest. And, and I get it. That's fine. I hate it. I'm happy those people exist, but I'm not one of them. I'll tell you what, let, let's, one of the things I just want to sort of celebrate, for, which is, means a lot to me, is that you agreed to write a walkthrough for our volume three. And it, it was about front loading behavior management, slightly ironically, perhaps. But yeah. because, yeah. because th- through your experiences, you've got some really nice, punchy ideas about that, like that work. Yeah. Front loading means of participation and those sorts of nice ideas about getting ahead of the behavior. So, through this sort of pain you've actually crystallized some really nice clear ideas so i think that's really and i i think that's absolutely wonderful 
as long as it's needed as long as it's needed i'm happy to do it but i will pray every single day of my life that it won't be needed much for you know for much longer can i can i just switch gear a bit so with the time we have this is asking about something else which is one of the things i'm really interested in is your uh ideas about the the the, the role of sort of experiential learning sort of practical work and a kind of tacit knowledge through practicals and science in science teaching set, set against the kind of instructional teaching drive which is obviously something you're really passionate about so and, and the slow practical idea that you really uh, really big about in in your book you you find you find that really useful so guiding students through those experiences so I, i'm just so interested in this because i feel like practical work and hands-on stuff sometimes gets pulled around a bit like behavior does as good and bad rather rather than finding the right place and nuance for it so say say a little about what your thoughts are on that i'd be really interested to hear that um it's it's a complicated one um people feel very very passionately about it um and to an extent it one of the things that I try and try and do in the book is is make clear that I'm not there to give my opinion of why we teach. Right. The, the book is about how. Yeah, the book is this is the stuff you're trying to teach. This is how you communicate it. This is the best way to do it. And, and the reason why I did that is because I think if you take any given concept, you know, photosynthesis, you know, I think there's good ways to teach photosynthesis and bad ways to teach photosynthesis. I don't think I think, and, and that's very easy, and it's to, that's an easy claim to make, and it's an easy claim to prove, because I could say, right, well, you guys go in one room, you guys go in the other room, you teach it this way, you teach it that way, and let's see whose kids know more by the end of it, fine. But when it comes to questions like, why do we teach, or what is the point of all this, or why should I teach photosynthesis, that's harder to pinned down and it might be that i have my own opinions about it but i am fully aware of the fact that they are only opinions and i'm never going to be able to prove that my opinions are more important than somebody else's so gove you know famously thought that it was the purpose of education was about passing on our greatest national treasures the greatest of that which has been thought and said and he was quoting someone who i've forgotten from like the 19th century or something uh, and that's fine that's what he said and, and there, are, there are other people who think that the purpose of education is to prepare children for a world of work. And that's fine. That's what they think. Uh, and there are other people who think the purpose of education is to enable the individual essence of the child to flourish and flower. And that's fine. That's what they think as well. And a book about how to teach was not the place to get into those discussions. And to be honest, you know, I, and, and, and much as I might enjoy them in a kind of sophistry uh, and you know cut and thrust of the you know student union type thing um, they're fun to argue about fundamentally I don't think they make a huge amount of difference at the coal face right they might be something nerdy to have a chat about over dinner but like I'm still teaching photosynthesis tomorrow right um, so it it wasn't it wasn't what I wanted to do in the book and, and practicals are the same because there are some people who believe that science is a practical subject, like design and technology is a practical subject. And there are some people who believe that science is a theoretical subject and the practical stuff is like a necessary evil. Yeah, you've just, you've got to get it done because this is how you prove things. But fundamentally, like that's technology, it's not science. And there are people who say, well, in you know Spain, there are no practicals, people don't do practicals. In Japan, nobody does practicals, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's not really for me to say in that book whether I think science is a practical or subject or to kind of scope out the extent to which we should be doing practicals. And I think what's more important to me, especially in that book, and when people come to me for advice, is that I'm saying to people, right, given, you know, given this stuff that you are teaching and you want to do this particular and, and either so you've got two routes you can either say right well is the practical going to help you teach this stuff okay yes or no uh, and, and if you think it will then this is how we should do it or you might be saying the practical is worthy in and of itself and like you said with the tacit stuff and i know that you're big on this and and you know and i, I don't disagree but you know you, you say when uh, every child should have 
should have had certain experiences. You know, every child should have been to the beach. Every child should have felt the sands between their toes. Every child should have planted cress. Every child should have built a circuit for themselves. Yeah, that, but the point, those things stand kind of independent of any like, like abstract knowledge about the world. They're just things that people have done that, that, are, that are an important part of being a rounded person. You could say the same, you know, everyone should have f- fallen in love. You know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> you know, it, there are certain experiences that you think are important to, like, just, just be a person. Um, and again, I, I might say, okay, yep, yeah, absolutely fine. You want to do the practical? Still, how are we going to do that? That, to me, is is more important uh, in, in the book. Yeah, and like I said, we can, we can discuss, you know, so it might be that you think that every student should have the chance to do, to build, to build a circuit. Okay, what kind of circuit? Uh, a series circuit, a parallel circuit, with a voltmeter, with an amateur, with a diode, with switches, with rheostats, with variable resistors. Like we could argue that uh, for a long time, but fundamentally, like the the gain from that argument in terms of teaching and actually delivering that experience is is smaller. It, you, we could spend hours talking about it for a five minute difference it might make in the classroom and, and, a, and a marginal dent in this person's character as they develop into a rounded human being, et cetera, et cetera. So what I wanted is that kind of density of usefulness in the book. Uh, and I think I, I tried to be really clear that it would be, I, I think it would be great if people found the book interesting, but fundamentally I don't care. The, the, main, the main purpose of the book is to be useful, right? I want it to be useful to people. Uh, and and like no one no one reads an ikea manual and it's like my god that's fascinating isn't it like, like it's not it's not subject of literary criticism that's fine because it's a document that aims to do a very specific thing which is show you how to put up your billy bookcase the book is very i you know obviously i'd love it if people found it interesting and enjoyable and intellectually stimulating and potentially even challenging and and that's fine and there are bits and pieces that i sprinkled in like that but like the main purpose is it's the ikea manual this is the science you've got to teach this is the manual for how to deliver it um so yeah for reading it did you you find it interesting or did you (laughs) well i think adam's doing himself a massive disservice there because it's not just about a secondary science because the section that you've written about explanations and how to and all the thought process that that underpin and how to explain a process or a concept or whatever it is I think that's applicable much more broadly than just in secondary science and I think that one I mean I will perfect and do some training tomorrow and I've mixed it out a bit ready tomorrow <laughs> because I'm talking about explain, the policy explanations but it, it is a how-to guide but it's not just a how-to guide for secondary science. So I think that, yes, you say it's the kind of Billy Bookcase thing for how to teach science, but I think you're, I think you're selling yourself short there, Adam. I think that actually it, it's a bit like Mark McCourt's book, where the front bit of his book is, although it's a maths book, it's way bigger than that. I think, that's, I think the same with yours. I, that's very kind of you to say. And, um, and look, it, it doesn't surprise me when people say things like that to me. You know, when when you say to me, yeah, I found it useful in a primary context as well, or when someone says I found it useful in teaching English literature or whatever, like, it doesn't surprise me because all I've done is I've taken evidence about how children learn and how they behave uh, and, and applied that in one area. And like for all we talk about, you know, the subjects as disciplines need to be uh, stand on their own, you know, substance and yada yada highfalutin philosophical words and yada yada fine like there is i mean it's teaching right there's still like quite a lot of overlap but but the key thing is that that it's never a claim well not yet at least a claim that i will make about it because i don't know and and for myself uh, i'm willing to trust so if someone says to me you know is your book useful for primary practitioners i'll say well claire seeley really liked it Andrew Percival liked it, but thought that some of the examples were not, you know, relevant or appropriate. And, and like, if you trust them, then then get it. But like, I don't have, you know, a fixed view on that. But this, by the way, this comes back to the beginning. I'm not allowed to do sales, right? I'm not allowed to do money because <laughs> yeah, I should say, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But but um, but it's really important. It, 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 there's no, there's nothing in that book that I haven't tried. 
right that I haven't done for myself there's a whole load of things that I could have put in various chapters because things I've seen other people do or seen online and thought oh yeah that that looks like it could work but there's there is nothing there's not a word in that book that I haven't tried or done myself and the reason why I feel comfortable advising it to others is because I've done it and, and it worked and it, and it was good but I've not done that for primary school I've not done that for English literature or history or further education or whatever. So it's not a claim that I'm willing to make. The only claim I'm willing to make is that this definitely works in secondary science. And Emma says it works in primary as well. Could that be a more scientific answer, Adam? Um, this is evidence. I've tested it in this context. I can say that it works in, in these conditions. I, I, can't. Well, I, 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 I think... Um, and I, I'm going to have to draw things to a close because it's. It, we, I'm looking at you know we could talk to you about so many things. There's, there's loads of other questions I was going to ask you, but I want to talk to about whiteboards. Go on, squeeze, I'm squeeze in another. another you, day. Can, you can no, you can squeeze in another. Go on. Go on, ask <laughs> about whiteboards. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I was I was being facetious. I, I know Adam loves a whiteboard. Primary loves a whiteboard. There's an affinity. There's a whiteboard affinity there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I think it's brilliant. I mean, the fact that you know you're one of these people that. You know, has this sort of uh, presence, uh, which because the, you 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 share your passions, you're so open about them. And I love this the the, the multi-dimensional aspect of your working life. It's so interesting to engage with. Uh, plus the, the the quite real groundedness in the realities of the classroom and the honesty around that. You don't get enough people sh sharing that stuff. So I, I just want to say thank you for joining us. It's, it's brilliant talking to you. I love the whole energy that you bring to it. And to anyone who wants a really interesting book with lots of philosophical aspects to it. It's about teaching primary. About, with a little bit of science thrown in. Um, it's, it's, it's a top read, so thank you. and definitely recommend it. So look, thank you so much, Adam. Well, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks yeah, for having me. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. You too. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks to everyone uh, joining us on our, on our podcast on, on YouTube or on, on the uh, podcast platform that you use. Uh, it's been a great run we've had uh, this summer and looking forward to more episodes. But thanks once again. Uh, this has been Mind the Gap with me, Tom Sherrington and Emma Turner. Thanks and goodbye. Mm -hmm.